You know, I I feel I, I'm scared out of my mind, mm. and I'm and I'm nervous. Uh, you know, uh, let me just put it to you this way: yeah. when I got ninety six percent on my organic chemistry paper, my mother said, "Where's the other four percent?" I know there's more of them in there. Well, fake passport isn't going to cut it. Yes, sir. These people have no criminal history whatsoever. What kind of busy shin. The busy kind. We've got evidence that they're harboring illegals. Passport warrant denied. Copy that. I'd quit poking around. Catch my drift? Oh, are you cool with Mo or Mohit or? No, no, I'm good with Mo. I'm good with Mo. <laughs> it suits you well. <laughs> where, where in the world are you, first of all? I'm, I'm in LA. I'm oh, in yeah. LA. Very cool. Yeah. I'm in, I'm in like uh, scorching, sweaty, uh, humid Chicago right now. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wish That's I was cool. back in LA. I've heard it's been hot in LA too, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, we were just in Miami and it's even crazier over there. Oh we man, this time of year. Miami's like, oh God, yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> It is. It's like being in a sauna, in a wet yeah. sauna. Well, that's I'm dealing with here. The humidity has been insane here, too, so I can relate. Yeah. But <laughs> staying cool, at least, you know, in that cool. way. Well, listen, it's a big day for you. Congrats on the release. This is a big <laughs> day. You. Is It's a release day. I'm curious for a film like that that's getting a lot of attention. It's getting a theatrical release. Sort of, uh, OK, the, the kid just starts his first day of college today or school, you know, and like it's off of me or it's it's that excitement kind of to see how that weekend does, especially since it's a Labor Day weekend um, and very fitting in a sense with the theme of this movie, you know, uh, yeah, for it to yeah. come out on this weekend, too. I don't know if that was strategically or not, but uh, I think there's a message there, too. But how do you feel on this day? Um, You know, I, I feel I, I'm scared out of my mind mm. and I'm and I'm nervous uh you know uh, let me just put it to you this way yeah. when I got 96 percent on my organic chemistry paper my mother said where's the other four <laughs> percent oh so, man given that I've been conditioned that way <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> it's kind of like what's gonna happen like I'm 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 afraid I'm I'm overwhelmed but you know I I see I'm also very happy that the message is getting out into the world and yeah. that people are supporting it there's a lot of people that's come out for it on social media you know we've had a very limited um marketing budget because we are quote unquote a smaller movie you know mm -hmm. like a, a system we don't have movie stars we don't have superheroes so just the fact that it's getting out and people are talking about it um is exciting you know and it is nice to see people who react i was at <clears throat> one of the premieres the preview is actually on Wednesday night at AMC City Walk at Universal, and it was oh, nice. sold out. Yeah, and I stayed after for about two hours and met people. And that, that's the most rewarding thing mm -hmm. as a filmmaker is even to get one person who says, hey, your movie really affected me. And, you know, I, I felt something when I watched it. So, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So, yeah. <laughs> no, that's really great that you got to, first of all, AMC uh, City Walk is a great location uh, to, to have yeah. a movie screen like that. But also, it's going to hit home because for a lot of these people in L.A., you know, you had to shoot. I know this location. You shot in Santee Alley, didn't you? That's right. That's you right. Know, I'm familiar with that place. And it always makes me wonder, you know, sort of, uh, you know, who are these people? And, and, you know, where sort of a lot of these things are like these garages there. And it always made me kind of wonder, where, like, where's the stuff come from, too? And... You know, it kind of rang true when I saw this movie, you know, because uh, you see certain things there that you don't see in other parts of L.A. if you go down there, you know, uh, and uh, and yeah, and it's it re definitely rang true. I, I definitely caught that on. And I, I thought it was really kind of really important that you actually shot it live there, uh, too. Uh, oh, can you yeah. a little bit about that experience? Because it's it's a very clustered space, especially on weekends. If you go there, there's a lot of people <laughs> yeah. selling stuff and visiting. It's You can't even park anywhere or move because there's just girls. No, no, I know. Curious when you filmed that. It's, it, it, was, it was important to me to capture the fashion district, like, mm -hmm. in an authentic way. And Santiali is kind of the heart, you know? Yeah. What's 
difficult in general about shooting in LA is that LA is saturated, you know, forever with movie production. So when you're trying to shoot on the streets, people are trying to shut you down. People are trying to, you know, shake you down for money. Any other city, they welcome you like a celebrity. They mm -hmm. want to take pictures with you. You know what I mean? So yes. that, and then on top of that, like you said, there's a lot of foot traffic there. We had ITC cops with us the whole time helping to shut down the road, but we still had so like the public loved it, but a lot of the storekeepers were like, you know, pay us or get out of here. So it was challenging. The most interesting thing about that shoot is that I rehearsed it for about two weeks. I rehearsed with an iPhone shooting through that area with a double for the kid. And I had another kid who was a, a friend's son and he was like 17 and I had my friend and they were, you know, he was sort of chasing his son who's also a Latino. And what was amazing was that not one person thought, hey, there's a kid here that's in trouble, that's being chased. Huh. Maybe I should stop and ask him something. Instead, somebody tried to sell him fanny packs which is why that's in the movie oh, i actually that one scene is like legit sort that of really that, that happened while i was rehearsing and i said and that's when it became clear to me how unaware people are about what's going on around them and that chase sequence is a metaphor for that for the lack of awareness you know there's all these i don't know yeah. if you caught it but like when he is being sold the fanny pack, the guy comes in and grabs him. Yes, him, yes. And he pushes him off and he starts running. And there's a big, there's a woman that comes with a clipboard saying, would you sign up to support the duckbill platypus? You know, like yeah. that's how in our own it world. Was manic. <laughs> I was manic. Yeah. I was curious, did you shoot that handheld? Because that's an interesting way of shooting. You are going through tunnels and stores and it's a long yeah. scene too. It's like straight up probably 10 minutes of, of live just footage, the foot chase that when it starts to end and through it. I mean, that must have been difficult too. I was curious if that was a handheld uh, shot. It was. It was handheld and, you know, the operator was great. Um, he really knew like, cause you know, normally a handheld would be so much shakier and yeah. it was fairly steady for, for how it was shot. The interesting thing about that was I wanted to do it as a one take. So it's eight different shots that we stitched together. And uh -huh. it's because my favorite foot chase of all time was in point break, the Patrick Swayze Keanu through the little yeah. alleys. And that's LA too. So I saw that and I said, I want to do something that has the same kinetic energy as this, but I want to sort of upgrade it or not even upgrade it, but do my unique version of it, which is to do it as a one take, you know? Mm, interesting. It comes off that way. And I think it works that way because it's a constant chase. If you had like some cut scenes and whatnot. Yeah, would, yeah. It'd be different. <laughs> yeah, it, it adds that authenticity. That's it's like, man, there's some stamina there too, man. <laughs> for this totally. Jesus uh, running that way too, but that that was interesting in, in that way uh, how it was presented and shot. But man, it's just the the theme and this story here, like this is literally in our backyards, and we sort of see this with a blind eye. You know, what I mean, especially we know these locations, and in a town like LA, for this stuff to happen is just kind of ludicrous and insane. That law hasn't gotten into this, or or I feel like even with Santi Alley, some of the you know selling stuff, like you see cops just drive by, sort of a blind eye or whatnot. Like there's just no straight focus so like let's figure out what's going on here you know and do something yeah there i mean for me i made the movie the way i did for exactly the reason that you just said i didn't want to make a docudrama mm -hmm. and i feel so we're mad about that, that I wasn't, I didn't make this very intricate portrait and get into the real details and the politics and all that. And I did that on purpose because most people don't care. And most people who are not already converted to the issue aren't going to go see a movie like that, right? Because a mm -hmm. movie that's docudrama is scratching your intellectual curiosity. I wanted to hammer you over the head. I wanted to pull at your heartstrings why? Because I wanted you at the end to say enough is enough. I want to do something about this. Right. You know what I mean? So I yeah. wanted to make like a very emotionally intense movie so that you actually felt like doing something as opposed to when, wow, that's interesting. And then you walk away and throw your popcorn away and you forget about it. Yeah, and it makes you think too, who 
are these powerful people behind it? Because you need to have some flow and influence to be able to do this. Because like you see the cops are literally st staking out and looking, but they can't go in. You know, that search warrant and whatnot, or something's holding it back the whole time. Like, oh, just go in there. You know, like, as an audience member, you're watching that too. But then you kind of realize the more it goes on, like, oh, there's some really powerful people behind all this that have a lot of influence. And the reason they're not being, you know, infiltrated or whatnot, because they have protection in some ways. Totally. And you know, what's really interesting about that too, is I feel like that moment where I've had a bunch of people say to me, well, when the kid peeks out of the door, yeah. like, why didn't they do anything? And I'm like, well, you're looking at it from the kid's point of view and you've seen everything on the inside. On the outside, those cops broke the law because they uh -huh. crossed the private property without a warrant and yeah. started conducting an unauthorized search, right? Like I had LAPD with me on set. Like I had a consultant actively telling me what they can and cannot do. So that was really frustrating. And obviously when we got to the point in the story where that SD card went into the camera and he couldn't confirm, mm -hmm. if he had actually seen what was on that camera, he could, you know, he could have performed an arrest, but yeah. ultimately he couldn't. And then, yes, he got a call that said, hey, like there isn't enough evidence here and there is bureaucracy. And we know there's bureaucracy in, mm -hmm. in, in all governments. And that's what I believe is part of the problem of why we still have this problem. Yeah. It's bureaucracy in the, in the governments. You know what I mean? I feel like sometimes we, we talk about our focus of like this stuff is the trafficking, the sex it happening all over the world. We kind of look at it in different parts of the world, but when it's literally in your back door, it's so scary that you almost feel like people want to sweep it under the rug and pretend it's not there. No. And, and look, I, I've got to tell you, this has been a six year journey for me. Yeah. And I guess this is a good thing, but there's also another side to it for me as a filmmaker. I want, I want set out to tell a story. You know what I mean? Like I'm a, I'm a filmmaker. I told the hero's journey of a young boy who lost his voice. And through the course of the movie, you know, he reclaims his voice. Yeah. You know, kind of an allegory Literally. for the 12 million. Literally, right. And he's representative of, of the 12 million kids now that don't have a voice. But I wasn't as about the issue because in reality, when I started making the movie, I'd read about one case in El Monte, California mm. that happened in 1995. I then contacted someone in the labor department and they said, look, they are finding still more and more cases, but it's only in the last couple years that it's blown wide into the mainstream media. It really started last February when Hannah Dreyer at the New York Times did an expose about migrant children, 300,000 migrant children who've gone missing, many of whom have ended up in the supply chains of large American corporations. Wow. you know because of third party contracting now that wasn't on my mind when i was making mm -hmm. the movie it just seemed to be that the timing worked out i just found it interesting being an immigrant being from india originally where there are a lot of sweatshops you know we know in southeast asia yeah. that there was even one case of this happening in america an hour from where i live and that's what spurned me to start writing the movie and then i started seeing more and more cases and it's like it's almost you know, increased a hundredfold since I actually started making the film. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. And, you know, I knew this was a, a long process for you too, because not only, <laughs> I know Renata Vaca, and she looks so yeah. young in the movie. I'm like, I know. know. This is probably years back, you know, she's been yeah. in Saw since and everything. So how long has this journey been for you? Because you see these actors now sort of now breaking out and they're, some of them are, are known now. And, and Ari, when you see yeah. uh, him at the end too, it's like, oh, wow, he's matured and grown too. He's, a, he's, a, he's an old man now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> No. So, so what happened was I actually, I actually read the case in 2009. Like wow. that's how back. Yeah. I then wrote it in 2010 while my mom was getting a bone marrow transplant. She had cancer and, you know, I wrote it while I wrote it in three weeks, the original draft while she was in the hospital. Wow. And it was announced in 2010 with Pierce Brosnan and his company. And then unfortunately, like we announced it in June of 2010, and by the end of June, my mom was terminally ill and I left LA. I mean, I was gone from 2010 to 2017. I mm. couldn't work on anything. I pretty much was a full-time caretaker for my mom. And she passed away in 2017. And it took me a while to sort of get through that. And then I came back to it. And so we didn't actually start shooting 
until the end of 2018. And then we ran out of money and we then we shot in 2019 and then we ran out of money and edited and then we shot in 2020. And then we ran out of money and went back to post in 2021. And it was like, we didn't finish the movie until the summer of 2022, summer to fall, like in that area. That's when it finished. Wow, that's amazing. How long? It's a personal <laughs> movie to you just with your yeah. own life journey and the connection you had sort of with your mom too. And I, and you do put a mention there too at, at the credits. I, I noticed that. So this is, this is personal in so many levels for your own reflection of your life too. Absolutely. It's, uh, you know, my mom, when she died, I used her life insurance policy to make the movie. Wow. And honestly, like what motivated me even into this character is that my father, <clears throat> you know, my father and mother are both from a province in India called Sindh. And now that province is in Pakistan because in 47, when the partition happened, you know, they were kicked out of their homes because they were Hindus living in a, you know, majority Muslim area. And that was mm -hmm. the deal that Gandhi had made with Jinnah. And so they were sort of kicked out. And my dad at seven years old, you know, he worked in very difficult conditions. He had, you know, when I was a kid, he had told me, look, you know, like I worked as a T-boy, I worked in sweatshops and I had to like get my way out of it. And it was interesting to me because it gave me an insight into his own, the way he was with us as a father. Cause he was, I know he wanted the best for us, but he was incredibly abusive. Like it was like, get straight A's or you get a beating, get, stay out of trouble. Or you get a beating. I mean, that's how it was in those days. And so when I was, when I decided to write the movie and really become a writer is when I read Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces. And in that he talks about atonement with the father being the final boon for the hero, where he recognizes that the ogre aspect of the father is like a reflection of the hero's own ego, because the hero must recognize that the father through his ogre aspect is preparing the hero for the office of life for without all that strife and stress and purification. He talks about the story of Icarus, you know, where his wings were burnt off. And so I looked at it like, Hey, maybe my father gave me a gift. And in mm. the movie, Jesus, Cesar and El Jefe are all my dad at different stages of, of his life. And in many ways it, it helped me forgive him because I understood where his trauma came from. Uh-huh. That really hits home now when you, you put it yeah. that way. And it, and it makes sense. You know, sometimes you're you're a sort of part of your condition, you know, and in surroundings, you become that, you know, in a lot of ways. And it molds you in a good or a bad way in that way. So, wow, fascinating uh, all around. Yep. I mean, uh, like I said, I, I thought you picked some really good actors here uh, who, who clearly are now – making a name for themselves too but uh the performance wise it's you know it's it's so interesting watch a movie where the main character doesn't utter a word and really doesn't say anything through almost 95 percent of it you know and and still feels so compelled so i think it's credit to you and um just ari's performance too uh you know uh, as, as a young kid still at the time and, and everyone who was involved too uh, to, to yeah. get this done. And you know what? Hard work uh, eventually pays off. And this is where you're at. You know, you got some great backing, it seems like, from some really prominent people. And now it's on the big screen. It must be kind of amazing to think about it. It is. It is. And I think probably the most significant thing that came out of it was, you know, the people that joined the fight who were affected by the movie. I mean, you know, Tony Robbins, mm -hmm. um, I have watched his videos for years. Whenever I, even when my mom died, like some of his messaging has really helped me, some of his ideas. So to have him come on board. And then, you know, the, the craziest moment was I became a filmmaker because of Rocky. I mean, I was the 12 year old kid that was getting bullied and beaten at home in school. And my neighbor brought over Rocky and I saw him take that beating. And, you know, in round 14, Mickey's telling him to stay down and he gets up and he says to the champ, let's go. I mean, that changed my life. Like I asked myself, why did my dad teach me never to give up? And mm -hmm. so to have Sylvester Stallone like endorse the movie was just like, I, is this happening? <laughs> like on my first film, like that truly was, has been the, the, the greatest moment like yeah. of my life, I would say to have, you know, all I want to do is do stuff that inspires and empowers people and to have the person that inspired me 
now support me and say that the film that I made touched him is is truly a gift. And it really is. And people are going to be touched uh, seeing that. And I think that the best thing you can do as, as a filmmaker is really to have people care and come out of it. Best movies are ones you think about it, makes you reevaluate maybe your own life uh, or, or think about it, you know, more than after, you know, the credits start uh, stop rolling. Uh, and I think this is one of those movies where it'll make you think and want to do and feel passion for it and uh, and about the subject matter. And really, you know, hearing your story, it's really a full circle thing. And it, you yeah, know, yeah, completely. these things don't happen by coincidence. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work, dedication. But uh, once it comes around, you know, it, it it kind of validates all you've been through and all that you've devoted to this. And uh I'm happy for you. I'm happy for you for Thank this you moment. So uh, and it was <laughs> yeah. well earned. It really was. And like I said, uh, in a world of superheroes and all sorts of movies we always get, it's really good to see something that um, can impact you and uh, impact others who will watch it. I told you. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me, man. I appreciate it. It was been hey, good, good talking to you. Absolutely. This is fantastic. I uh, really had a pleasure talking to you and, and, and enjoyed what I saw and, and urged people to go see it out and, uh, perfect time. It's a long weekend. So go out there to the movies and, and you know, uh, see something worthwhile. And I feel like this movie is it. So hopefully there's more for you. Hey, this is a really <laughs> good start. I'm telling you, you're going to, yeah. <laughs> uh, after, after the stresses go out, this is going to be a really inspiring moment for you to, to do more stuff. And I'm, I'm looking forward to see what's next from you. Totally. I'm going to go sleep for a month. In a few weeks. <laughs> you do need a break, probably. This has been decades in the making, you know, seems like not only just uh, what you see, uh, but hey, appreciate you taking the time, Mo, and, and I'm glad Rachel Thank connected you. us to, to talk about this. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jim. Hey, all the best to you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.